tonight, so follow with me, please. The book of Jude. Um, if you were not here last uh, Sunday night, I'm going to very briefly hit a couple of things, and we're moving on tonight. I'm preaching on uh, Why Baptist Part 2, and the sermon is Baptist and Their Beliefs. Jude, the book of Jude, verse, uh, the only cha- on one chapter, um, so it's verse number 3. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ started the church when he was here. He said, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So we know that during this time, right here, Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, he began the church. Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. I don't believe that's an accident. It could have called him anything else in the world, but it called him John the Baptist. And God looked down and said, this is my son. I am well pleased. It didn't say John the Methodist. I know I'll get emails over that and they'll say, oh, you're trying to say, I ain't trying to say nothing. I'm saying what it says. That's what it says. And you're going to have to pray about that. It does say that. Look here in Jude, verse number three. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, They hadn't that day. It was common to them. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints, unto the saints. That's what I'm going to do tonight. I'm going to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Now, as you see here, and I, I cannot do this all again, but... The, these are the days of the apostles. 33 A.D., Jesus went back to heaven. The Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost, and these guys went out preaching everywhere. They got, they got people saved by the tens of thousands. At that time, Rome was ruling the world. As a matter of fact, for 800 years, they call it pagan Rome. Pagan Rome was in charge of the world. They killed John the Baptist. They killed the apostle Paul. They killed the Lord Jesus. They were Romans. Romans, and there's nothing in the Bible ever good about Rome. Rome has been the eternal enemy of God's people and the truth from ever since before Jesus came the first time. Now, during this time, uh, they, they killed three million Christians because they would not submit to the Roman government. About 300 A.D., 313, isn't that weird? 313 Constantine had, um, I don't know if he ate too much pizza or what, but one night he had a dream and he saw a cross up in the sky and a sign said, in this sign conquer. And you know what he did? He thought God told him to conquer the world and make it under Roman government. And that is where the Catholic Church started. 313. His buddy Augustine, his buddy Eusebius got those 50 Bibles we talked about last week from the Alexandrian text back here in, in, in Africa and Egypt and they come from the wrong one and they call it Catholic. Do you know what the word Catholic means? Universal. All one. One big. So instead of pagan Rome, it now is papal Rome. The Pope. The first Pope, I think it was Leo uh, I'll, I'll mention him in, in a minute, right around in here. And during this time is when all these weird beliefs started popping up, like Mariality. That means worship Mary like she's God. The Catholic Church believes that Mary is the mother of God. The Catholic Church also teaches Immaculate Conception. Immaculate Conception means Mary was conceived, had no sin, and lived a sinless life and was caught up to heaven without ever dying, all that's Catholic dogma and tradition. Now, during this time, the Eucharist, that's the holy wafer and the wine, when the priest blesses the wine and the bread, it turns into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. That's called transubstantiation. And the Catholic Church today teaches the doctrine of transubstantiation. You and I, we believe 100% different than that. We believe that when we eat that piece of bread, it's a piece of bread. And it is a symbol of Jesus' death 
and dying for us. This do in remembrance of me. So the Catholic receives Christ every Sunday by taking the Mass. I've never been to a Catholic Mass. I've, I've been, I've been and, and watched a few on TV and stuff. And according to the Catholic Church, I'm cursed because I've never partaken of a Mass blessed by a Catholic priest. But now remember, during this time, there were always people that was preaching the truth. The Monetists. This guy named Monetus, he preached the same thing the apostles. As a matter of fact, the apostles started their churches. And the people that followed Monetus were called Monetus were called Monetists. It's normal for people to when people follow somebody, for them to be called after their name. People used to call people Castellites. Everyone when they say, Oh, you're a Castellite. Anytime anybody takes a strong stand, people that follow them are branded. With that name. So they called them monetists. They were called this by their enemies. And the monetists rejected this. They rejected all this false teaching of Rome. Novation come right after him. The Donatists, the exact same thing. Won't take time to go into all that tonight. And about this time, they were called Anabaptists. Anna means again, re, rebaptized. And the reason they called them that was because when these people come from the Catholic Church, they were baptized as an infant. And we're going to see in just a minute that there was millions of people died because they would not accept infant baptism, baptizing babies. And right now in this town, the Catholics baptize babies, Methodists sprinkle babies, Presbyterians sprinkle babies, Lutherans sprinkle babies or, or baptize them. Baptists have never sprinkled babies. And I'll tell you why in just a minute. It don't do no good. Uh, it don't do you no good to get baptized until you're uh, uh, in your mind receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's what John the Baptist preached. He preached, you repent, get right with God, then I'll baptize you. No babies, no babies. So it's obvious if you think about it why the Catholic Church taught infant baptism. Think about it. If you can get a baby baptized when he's born and then tell him all his life, you're Catholic, you're Catholic, you're Catholic, and if you ever leave the Holy Mother Church, you're cursed and you'll go to hell, you keep them in that way. And that's what they've done. And we'll, we'll talk more about that. With these, these Anna means rebaptized. So when one of these people got saved and come over here, they made them get baptized the right way. They say, you just now get saved, now you've got to be baptized, and we put them under the water and immerse them, and that's a picture of your salvation. Now, those are the Bogomiles, the Petrobution, that Peter... Uh, 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 Petribution, the Albigenses, the Waldenses. We studied about them. We're going to talk more about them next week, Lord willing. The Waldensians was one of the most persecuted groups in northern Italy. Their churches started right off the people of, of the Apostle Paul and these con their converts. I mean, these people started their churches. And they run them people all over northern Italy and killed them by the tens of thousands. And they finally left Italy, and you know where they come to? North Carolina. And they settled across the interstate right over there. That's Valdez. The word Valdez in Italian means Waldensian. And I strongly urge everybody here to go over there and go through that trail of faith. It's an amazing study. Every kid in this church needs to go through there and see how those people did and down through the ages. They didn't come settle here until the 1800s. We'll talk more about that later. But first I want to talk about tonight, Catholic digression. That means the Catholic church starts out wrong and gets worse and worse and worse. Nero, right here during the early days before there was a Catholic church, lit his garden with Christians. You know, on a Friday night they'd have a big party. He'd have these big stakes like this right here and he'd have the Christians brought out and tied their arms and their feet to them and put tar and pitch on them and set them on fire. And that's how they'd light the whole football field when they'd dance and drink in their wicked parties. They hated the Christians, just like Jesus said. They killed John. They, uh, they killed Paul. They killed uh, uh, Peter. He's crucified upside down. And then about 400 A.D., along in this time right in here, they established what's called a church state. A church state is a state enforcing the laws of a church. That's 
very, very wicked. That's still in effect today in Italy, Portugal, Spain, Brazil, places like that, that are Catholic countries like 90-something percent. And the government enforces Catholic law. They hid Bibles. They wouldn't let the people have Bibles. Now, why wouldn't you let the people have Bibles? Well, duh, because half the stuff you believe ain't in there, and you've got to keep them in the dark. That's why they called it Dark Ages. And you'd be taught at school that it was just bad Roman powers and stuff, but it ain't, that ain't true. From 500 A.D. to 1500 A.D., it's called the Dark Ages, and that's when the Catholic Church run the world, politically and spiritually. But all during that time, I keep telling you, there was people down here preaching. Cathari. You know what that word means? Pure, pure, Puritans. You ever heard of Puritans? Cathari, the Paulicians. They, pre- they believed so much in the apostles, Paul's teachings, that they called them Paulicians. And then they kept on preaching right on through. What I'm going to show you in the next couple of weeks, if there is an unbroken line from here where me and you are standing in Shining Light Baptist Church tonight, back through Judson, William Carey, Charles Spurgeon, John Wycliffe, through the Waldensons, the Anabaptists, the Donatists, the Monetists, the Apostles, and Peter, James, and John. And it was not always called Baptist, but they believed everything me and you believe tonight. That's what you don't hear in history class. So, let's move along. In 1000 A.D. began the Holy Crusades. The Crusades were not holy. The Crusades was a bunch of killers killing a bunch of other killers. Over in Asia, Middle East, there was Catholics and Muslims fighting. Uh, they, they persecuted the Christians when they found them. They kept people in the dark so they could keep them in the church. Um, they, they, kept, they were baptized into the Catholic Church and they were offered last rites. How many of you have ever seen like a movie star, somebody die and they'll say, well, the priest came right before he died and gave him last rites. You ever seen in the movies, the priest will always show up and he's doing this and everything. Like rites. What is that word, rite? R-I-T, ritual. See that? See that? Ritual. And it's not in the Bible. There's nothing in the Bible where you get right on your deathbed and you're blessed because the Catholic police gives you his blessing. Nothing like that whatsoever. But that way you keep the money coming in. About that time, they had the doctrine of purgatory. Purgatory is a place that's not heaven, but it's not hell. And it's in between purg, purge, purge. And it's a place where people who are eventually going to heaven but party a little too much go when they die to purge them for ever how many years before they can graduate on up into heaven. That's the doctrine of purgatory. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you tonight, that is not a Bible doctrine. There is no such place. In the Bible, two places where you go when you die. One's heaven and the other is hell. The doctrine of purgatory is not at all. Uh, They were to pay indulgences. Do you know what indulgences are? I think I got it up there, right there. See that right there? Indulgences. Indulgences. What does that sound like? Indulge. You could go down to the priest and you could say, look, I'm going to party this week and I'm going to commit adultery and I'm going to uh, get drunk and and I need some forgiveness on credit here. And you could give the priest so much money and that weekend would be took care of and you'd be forgiven. Now, you think I'm lying. How many people in here tonight would attest and confirm that what I just said was right? Raise your hand. There's one. She was Catholic before she was saved. Anybody else in here Catholic? She was Catholic before she was saved. They teach that indulgences is when you go uh, confess your sin or you can give money and give money and give money and eventually get mama or mama out of purgatory and graduate her on into heaven. I'm going to tell you something. I'll tell you something, people. I'm going to tell you something. Are you listening to me tonight? That's a wicked false doctrine. That's a money-making racket. That's what that is. That's a money-making religious scheme with a hierarchy. They kept people in the dark. They went and they, they had what they call the, the, uh, uh, valley, or the, uh, the, the uh, valley of heretics and the, and the kill, uh, pile of heretics. They chased 400 Christians down and they run to a cave and, the, and the, the, uh, the murderers kept them. Some of them guys wouldn't be baptized except for the, all of them except the right arm. And they held the right arm heart, so they said they killed with that arm. So they baptized every one of them and they left the right arm sticking out. 
and they killed 400 of these people that day. And a woman hid her baby in the rocks. And one of them soldiers grabbed that baby by the feet and slapped his brains out on that rock. And they put stuff in there and forced them people in that cave and burned them alive. They call it the pile of heretics. Um, they tied their hands to the ceiling and left them up like on this and put a 20, 25, 40 pound weight on their feet and then dropped them. And when they dropped, that weight pulled their shoulders and stuff out of socket. And they'd hang there like that and suffer and bleed. They put gunpowder in their mouths and blowed their brains out. They filled their mouth full of hot lead. They tied women down that were pregnant, sliced their bodies open, and let the pigs eat the baby out of their mama's body. We're talking the most wicked, filthy torture that the world's ever seen. The dark ages were that exactly. And you know why these people give, wouldn't give in? These people wouldn't give in because they said, we are not baptizing babies. We are not getting baptized and we do not believe that our baptism has anything to do with our salvation and we ain't doing it. And they killed them. They killed them because they would not agree. Now what you're seeing the Pope talk about, I'm getting ahead about, is Chrislam. You see, the Catholic Church can merge with whatever is popular and still remain true to old Holy Mother Church until it gets in control. You hear Chrislam. Mixing Christianity and Islam, that's what you're going to hear a lot about in the next few years. Where They do have a lot in common. They both had the same origin, Babylon, and uh, of the devil. And they're trying to make it so that you're a Christian, you're a Muslim, and you're a Muslim, you're a Christian. Baptists have always stood against that. Ladies and gentlemen, in the 1400s, the Spanish Inquisition. We don't have time to talk about all these things. And askew. Uh, she was burned at Smithfield, England, 1546, because she refused to believe that the mass turned into Jesus Christ. They said, you believe that's Jesus? And she said, no. A woman. And she stood there and they said, don't you believe that's God? She said, I read in my Bible where God made man, but I never read in my Bible where a man could make God. They tied her up and burned her at Smithfield, England, and they said she smiled as they tied her up and set her on fire. They offered prayers to the saints. That means praying to saints and prayers to, Ma, uh, to uh, Mary and that Mary was without sin. All right, with that in mind, remember there were people down here that believed everything right I mean, they was off on a few little things. My goodness, they didn't have but one Bible per 20,000 people. So you can, obviously, they're going to be off a little bit here and there. But the main things, they believe. What do we believe? What did they believe? What did these people believe back here? I give you 10 things they believe, and I'm just going to read these off and comment on them. Number one, they believed that the Bible is the absolute authority in all matters of faith and practice. Now, you're sitting here tonight saying, well, brother, I've heard that all my life, brother Dan. You don't know how odd that is. That ain't the way the rest of the world believes. The Catholic Church believes the Bible is authoritative and the Pope speaking and the church is authoritative. We don't believe that. We believe whatever the Bible says is right if every preacher in the world says something different. You see the difference? Now, number two, we believe, they believe in salvation by grace alone. You don't do nothing to earn salvation. You don't do nothing to keep salvation. It is the gift of God. Now, y'all are sitting here tonight saying, well, good night. What's the big deal about that? You'll, you'd be surprised what the big deal is. Me and you's enjoying the fruits of all these people giving their lives uh, so we could have this. Number three, they believe that only adult believers could get baptized. When I say adult, I'm talking about somebody old enough to understand. Babies can't get baptized. Number four, they believed in a regenerated church membership. That means you have to be saved before you can join the church. Number five, they believed in godly living and church discipline. 
That means they said, hey, if you're going to be a Christian, there ought to be a difference in your life. You ought to live like a Christian. You ought to act like a Christian. There are certain things you ought to do. There are certain things you ought not to do. Number, number six, they were anti-Roman church state. That means they believed in soul liberty. Now, that's one of the most important things I'm going to say tonight. Soul liberty. What does soul liberty mean? Soul liberty means nobody can tell me how I can worship God. The Pope can't. The priest can't. The government can't. Nobody can. Soul liberty. And then they believe in that the gospel is to be preached everywhere to every creature all over the world. And then they believe, number eight, that the local church is autonomous. Autonomous means self-governing. It means nobody, no hierarchy, no headquarters over in Rome, no headquarters in Georgia or in Tennessee or anywhere else has a right to tell this church, Shining Light Baptist Church, what we can do, what we can say, how we can worship, what we can preach. A local church is autonomous, independent, and have total freedom to do what they believe God wants them to do. Number nine, they believe there's two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And both these ordinances have nothing to do with getting saved. It shows what's already happened. See, the other churches teach that baptism is a part of your salvation. And what if you don't get baptized? Well, I guess somebody does it for you after you're dead in some of them. And then we believe, number 10, in non-violence of practice in our faith. That means we don't take over people who disagree with us and force them to become Baptist or Christian or anything else. They have freedom to reject it. You have freedom to believe anything you want. That's exactly what we believe. Shining Light Baptist Church believes every one of them things. And those beliefs go all the way back to here. All right? Let's move on just a little bit further. It's always been that way. You ought to get a book called The Martyr's Mirrors. Some of you people that like to read, get Ancient Baptist, a book called Ancient Baptist. And of course, the little book, Trail of Blood. And you get educated on these. We, uh, they were in the same geographical location as the seven churches in Revelation these people were. In other words, if you looked over there where they come from, that same area is where John wrote to the churches of Revelation. So we're right back in here the days of the apostles. Right back here. All right? Now, quickly. We'll move along quickly this, this, this evening. Other groups. What I'm now going to do is I'm going to give you what happened during here and after here. The Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther, in 1500, went, now you will hear this in school, and nailed his 95 theses on the door of the church in Wittenberg, Germany. How many of you have heard of that right there? All right, most of you have heard about that. That's very, if you go to college, they talk about it. That began what's called the Protestant Reformation. Now, you know what they teach? You know what the world teaches? You know what the encyclopedias teach? You know what most people on YouTube teach? You know what Catholic historians teach? You know what Lutheran, Presbyterian, Methodists teach? They teach that the church was underground and all messed up all this time and just popped up right here. We teach and can prove that the church down through here never was in the Catholic Church, never was a part of the Catholic Church, and didn't pop out. It had always been there. And when these guys came out of Rome, they brought a bunch of Rome with them. And that's why when you go to some of these churches, you see the priest with the collar on the back of that weird clothes. When they start wearing them weird clothes, weird clothes, collar on the back, all black, like the black-robed priest of the Old Testament. The Queen of Heaven, Mary. That's where that stuff started. Worshiping the false Diana, uh, the false god back uh, in, in the book of Acts. Now, when the Protestant Reformation came about, uh, they, uh, they, you know, and Luther, and, and you've got to give them credit, they did some good, and they preached, and, and uh, Martin Luther and these guys came out, and they began to preach, and, and they said, uh, uh, this, some of this stuff's a bunch of junk, and we don't believe it no more but we're still going to preach. And they preached. Martin Luther became the Lutherans. 
the Lutherans still have the book of worship and baptize babies. John Calvin, John Knox, we have Scotland, Switzerland, the Reformed Presbyterian churches began. What does a Presbyterian church believe? A Presbyterian church is the only church beside Baptist that believe you keep salvation no matter what. You're related to God, you're always related to Him. Every other group in the, in, in the, in the world teaches that you have to live up to a certain standard to stay a child of God. Now, that means the Wesleyans, the Methodists, the Congregationalists, the Quakers. You know why they call them Quakers? Because when they, they, would, they would do like this, and shake, like they having an earthquake, and shake, and they call them Quakers. The Church of England, Anglican, you've heard of that? Eastern Orthodox, all of them groups have a lot of Rome left in them. They pray to the saints. They pray for the dead. And they believe in baptismal regeneration and infant baptism. None of them ever got too far from Mama Rome. And what I'm going to be showing you all in the next couple of weeks is that all these groups here in 2017 are going right back to Mama under the control of of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, I don't have time to tell you a long thing on that, but about 1900 in America started popping up these groups, Pentecostals. The Pentecostal Church, they had that great revival, or whatever they thought, said it was, the Azusa Street Mission out there in Los Angeles. That's where the Pentecostal movement really took hold in this country. And I'm not saying these people are not saved. I'm not saying none of them people are not saved. There's a lot of saved people in them. I'm not saying a lot of Catholics ain't saved. There's a lot of Catholics saved in spite of their church. Not because of it. And these groups here popped up, that, and that became the Church of God, the Holiness Groups, Assemblies of God, Full Gospel. The reason they call them Full Gospel is because they think me and you don't preach the full gospel. We just preach part of it and they preach all of it. And the truth is, they, they don't understand it and, and get it out of context. Then come the Jehovah Witnesses. Judge Rutherford, Pastor Russell. He went around writing on the sidewalks about hell because he's scared of going to hell. And then he figured out there wasn't no hell. And that's what began the Jehovah Witnesses. The Mormons. Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith said he was out and the angel Moroni appeared to him. And Moroni gave him the baloney, brother. And he got these golden plates, which nobody ever saw, and it began the Mormon church. The Mormon church teaches that Jesus and the devil were brothers and that when you die, you can be on your own planet, over your own universe, excuse me, populating your whole universe with your spirit wives. And you ladies, if you make it, your hope is to be eternally pregnant, producing spirit babies to populate other universes. They believe in the holy underwear. Certain Mormons, you don't believe this, they have their holy underwear on. I know some that do it. And that underwear can never not touch their body. When they take a shower, they take the dirty ones off, keep their foot on it while they're taking a shower, get out, put the clean ones on, before their foot ever don't touch the underwear. Where that come from, I have no idea in this world. The Jehovah Witnesses teach no hell. Seventh-day Adventist, Mary Ellen White. The woman began their religion, and they teach to keep the seventh day. They don't understand that we're not Old Testament Jews, and they think you're supposed to keep the Old Testament Sabbath. Christian Science... Same way. This is Mary Baker Glover Patterson Eddy. That's all her husband's names. And she started, she started that uh, Christian science. The Church of Christ began with Alexander Campbell. And the Church of Christ teaches that you have to be baptized or you're not saved. That's your duck dynasty people. That's what they believe. Now, 
make a long story short, I'll say this. Many do not realize that the beginning of the United States of America was founded by people that believe like us. Actually, when they first come to America, I feel really bad, y'all. Pray for me. Um, when they first came to America, Massachusetts actually passed a law that Baptists couldn't preach openly and freely. They were trying to make America just like the old country and make a state church. And they had it. The Episcopalians, Congregationalists up in Virginia and in Massachusetts. Now listen carefully. There was a man by the name of John Clark. He was a Baptist preacher. In 1637, there was a lot of religious controversy going on in America. And John Clark and them guys, they went and claimed Aquidneck Island. That's now what we know as Rhode Island in the spring of 1638, somewhere along in there. And John Clark wanted the first government in the world to allow its citizens civil and religious liberty. Listen to me. You'll never hear this in a public school. John Clark said, I want a government where we have complete liberty to worship God. And they said, no, no, we feel like the church has control of that. And 1638, he founded a Baptist church. And brother, Roger Williams gets a lot of credit for it, but he had a church and didn't last but four months. John Clark pastored his till he died. And he said this. He went back to England and he studied. And he said, if you guys will give me the permission, I'm going to go to America and we're going to make it different. And he came back to America about 10 years later and he said, look, he said, I want religious liberty. He said, uh, I want it to lay in the hearts of men the strongest obligations of loyalty. And he, he, he said, I, they gave him the Rhode Island Charter in 1663. And he said, I want to try a lively experiment. Now listen to this. He said, I want to try a lively experiment with the principles of soul liberty set forth and the basis of the government. And the Baptists shed their blood for these rights to form a government like that. From Europe, the United States of America is established on these principles. That means this. When John Clark come back, he said, I've got it. I've got a government figured out that'll work. Have you ever wondered why God's blessed America like he has? There's never been a country outside of Israel in the Old Testament that's been blessed like America. It's not because of our geography. Canada's right above us. They ain't got it. Mexico's right below us. They ain't got it. Why America? Old John Clark come back and he said, look. He said, we believe in liberty. We don't want it like Europe. We don't want it like England and the state church or the Anglican church and the church of England. We don't want the Roman Catholic church or any other church telling us what to do. We want absolute religious liberty. And in 1700, 1800, the Baptists flourished. The Whitfields and Wesley's preached. But the Baptists, them guys wasn't Baptists, but the Baptists were the recipients of all their converts. And if you want to know why there's a Baptist church down every road you go down from Maryland on down to Florida, it's because them guys preached all over this country. And they started Baptist churches everywhere. George Washington sent James Madison to study the Baptists and their beliefs. And they said, well, we'll give you Rhode Island. You can do whatever you want to. And they said, no. We want it for every state. And listen to me. George Washington told James Madison, you go study them people, and I think they're on to something. So James Madison... Patrick Henry and John Adams went back and talked to George Washington and said, I think these people are right. This lively experiment, let's try it. And they sat down and wrote the Bill of Rights. You know what the Bill of Rights are? The Bill of Rights is, number one, as you know, Congress shall make no law 
regarding religion or the free exercise thereof. Freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of worship. Number two, the Bill of Rights said you have the right to bear arms. You know how come you can own a gun? Because them guys right there preached and preached and preached and preached, we want liberty. Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. You know what the fifth Bill of Rights says? You don't have to testify against yourself in a court of law. You know what I said? I plead the fifth. That's where that come from. You know what the seventh one is? You have a right to a fair trial and a jury. You know what number four is? The law. Somebody can't break in and search your house without a reasonable uh, a reason for it, like they did. See, y'all don't realize, people, the world ain't always been like it is now. For all these hundreds of thousands of years, it was the state run the church and the government run the people, and they just done whatever they wanted to. And if you disagreed with them, they'd burn you. You know why me and you can get in here and I can preach whatever I want to tonight? Because that Bill of Rights and a bunch of Baptists that believe the Bible. And I'm going to make a statement now and I'm through. And we'll continue on. i got a bunch more stuff I could talk about, but I think I'm going to wait until next week. I'm going to make a statement. In my belief and from my study, America was founded by people who believe Baptist principles. They were not all Baptist, but I believe God used the Baptist preachers in faith to found this country and the religious liberties that me and you have. And America owes a great debt of gratitude to the Baptist who formed our foundation of this country. I can't prove this, but I believe it. I believe God's blessed America tonight because of people that preach exactly what me and you believe and preach here tonight all the way back through. That's why we're Baptist. That's why we're not the stick or the rock or the tree or the flower or the river. But we have a heritage that runs all the way back through there to there. One man said, well, I don't want to call my church Baptist because I believe we can get more people if we don't. But I still believe that way. That's like saying, I, I don't want to wear my wedding band because I don't want people to know it. I'm telling you, people, we've got a heritage. And I'm just getting started. Next week, we're going to talk more about the history of that Catholic church, and I'm going to tell you about some other stuff, too. I want to read you something here in closing tonight. And it says this. Historians say this. All these were not even Baptist historians. W.A. Gerald, all that Baptists mean by succession is... There have never been a day since the organization of the New Testament church which there, was, in which there was no genuine church of New Testament existing on earth. That means there never was no dark ages when the church couldn't be found. G.H. Orchard, church historian, said, I have demonstrated as far as human testimony is allowed to prove any fact that the Baptist church as the church of Christ has existed from the day of Pentecost to this period. J.M. Carroll, into the dark ages went a group of many churches which were in never in any way identified with the Catholic Church. Out of the dark ages came a group of many churches which had never been identified with the Catholic Church. That's why we're not Protestants. You're Catholic, Protestant, or Baptist. Let's stand by our head for prayer.